everyone. So since uh, the morning, we have been uh, talking about how to create it and uh, some of the complications. Uh, so assuming that we have created, you've got a beautiful axis uh, in your place. Now let's see how can we maintain it because we are dealing with humans with limited renal or vascular real estate. Few arteries, few veins, some areas put to put the graft in. So we don't have the luxury of keep losing the axis. So what we get, we have to make sure that we get the best out of it. Now, there are different types of axes. Uh, we have been talking about fistulas and grafts. There are some which are hybrid, which is like a, a graft and a catheter. We're not going to talk about that. We're definitely not talking about the PD catheter and the cathet other catheters. To start off with, surveillance. It gets thrown around so much, but what does really surveillance mean? If you go by the public health definition, it has a lot of words, data, collection, analysis, interpretation, but in reality, when we talk about the vascular access surveillance, it doesn't involve a, a whole lot of these things, right? Because a vascular surveillance is revolves around the single most concept that the stenosis or a luminal narrowing inside the dialysis circuit is a culprit for the whole problem that we face with vascular access. Is that so? I would, I wish. But that's what we came in for. Why? Because a couple of decades ago, when the dialysis access, especially in, in US, which was predominantly grafts which were clotting left and right, there was no interventional nephrology, no vascular access centers to declot them. They were hospitalized, they spent multiple days in the hospital just to get a procedure done. That's the time duration when our mentors like Dr. Bestrav, who mentored me about this, they thought about these surveillance methodologies because they wanted to prevent an access from clotting. During that time, pretty much any procedure which was done showed a stenosis. So the whole concept started to revolve around stenosis as being the central most, or the single most important factor causing the thrombosis. But now, these days, we are now you know, looking into the infection, access maturation delays, access loss, and a, and a whole lot of other outcome measures that we are surveilling, right? But in reality, the surveillance and monitoring those two words which have been thrown around from the Kedoki for a while is kind of arbitrary, right? You can't have a surveillance if you're not going to examine so it is the monitoring as defined, which is your physical examination, lab parameters, dialysis parameters, is an integral part of any access care. And if we were all so good at the physical examination, then we didn't really need to do anything else. But as we all know, the physical examination is a vanishing skill. Why? Because we're increasingly relying upon our, uh, our additional um, testings and other things. And many a times with our busy time, we might not have that time to look and feel and hear. So the surveillance and, and monitoring is kind of, in my mind, it's, a, it's the same spectrum. I like to call it as an enhanced monitoring if you're using some tools like ultrasound or the pressure or the flow, media, or flow measurements. Well, why do we need to do the surveillance? Because our patients are having one of the worst situations. They're having bad veins to begin with when you are creating a fistula. Whatever you create, most of them, they fail. And even when you create, the, 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 uh, the body is going to react in the form of neointimal hyperplasia, which is the uh, intima hyperproliferating, causing the luminal narrowing. Even if you cross that hurdle, you might start developing degeneration in the form of aneurysms, or you might, we all talked about the central vein stenosis, due to all the catheters that you put every, or we put every single day in our patients. And some of the unfortunate ones even develop ischemic steel syndromes and ischemic mono, um, IMN. So these, our patients are having a lot of disadvantage. So when you do get a functioning access, it is imperative on us to take the lead and save it. If we don't save it, what happens? It clots. It clots. Now we have beautiful interventional techniques, and we are able to open them up. 
If we can't open there, go to the catheter. If they go to catheter, you get a new access. But how much does this cost? An access conversion, a functioning access into a new access uh, via a catheter. Our internal analysis, this is not published data, but this is our own internal financial analysis, it costs about $16,000. Every time you have a functioning fistula or a graft, it gets clotted and abandoned, and you're now putting a catheter and putting a new access in US, right? So it's not just it affects the patient, it also affects everybody's bottom line, right? Now, broadly, the surveillance can be divided into flow-mediated and pressure-mediated. I'm not going to talk about the pressure because I do have a conflict there. Now, the flow is always uh, um, has been the predominant surveillance methodology which has been used in managing the access care. Now, the flows can be measured either th using the ultrasound or using uh, costly devices and transonics, presenius, and various other uh, uh, devices which are available. The problem is they are all snapshot in time. Some can be done monthly or bimonthly. Every time you want to do a, a transonic or a Fresenius online dialysis clearance, uh, you always have to, it impacts the dialysis delivery. As it is, our patients are getting less dialysis time, right? So in, and on top of everything, cost. Right? So, what can we do? Ultrasound is a good bargain, if you ask me. Why? Before we go to that, one of the things that we always do is we are using a one-size-fits-all for every single thing that we do. Trying to fit a single surveillance methodology for the entire access spectrum, irrespective of which patient it is, which side the access was done, is it really true that one size fits all? I guess not. Because if you look at the surveillance, and different surveillance, and when they looked at the site of stenosis, whether it is the inflow in the body or the outflow, a nice analysis showed that a physical examination was a lot more sensitive along with access flow measurement if the problem was in the inflow, that is the feeding artery, arterial anastomosis, juxta anastomotic area. The outflow is good if with the physical examination and the pressure-based access surveillance. But the story doesn't end here. The, pro the, the fact of the matter is, if you combine everything, monitoring, which is your physical and your access flow measurements, and plus, and, uh, plus or minus some additional um, uh, surveillance tools, you can make a difference in the access outcomes. It not only increases the patency, the access life could also be, as demonstrated by a very recent randomized control trial. The reason I'm highlighting a very recent is, this area has been devoid of a good randomized control trial for a very long time in the last two decades. Somehow we accepted what we had and we didn't want to think about the others. But now I think the time has come and that's where the organizations like Avatar and their uh, clinical trials will going to make a difference. Now the issue is, we all have to learn how to do a good examination before we can do, okay, I don't think I can do this. There was supposed to be a video. Can you play the video from the back end? All right, okay. Let's look at the examination. It's a very simple one minute video. It doesn't take too long and the steps are very simple. We use this to teach our uh, fellows and cannulators. So an axis, is, as you see, that, that's where the uh, arterial anastomosis is. We are holding the pressure very close to the arterial anastomosis, and we are gonna be checking the pulse, the strength of that pulse. That strength of the pulse will tell you how good the inflow is. And the rest of the axis is here, and as, we, as you see, we had already done an uh, ultrasound mapping. There was a small superficial vein which had gone up. Uh, over the coursing over the fistula and any cannulation during that period or in that area will cause infiltration. So now what I'm doing is I'm, I usually with my middle finger I'm applying total occlusions and with my index finger I'm checking the pulse strength and this is called the arm elevation test. You just raise the arm, you see how nicely, uh, pay attention to these aneurysms, how nicely they just collapsed completely. So just with this simple technique what we call it as an augmentation test for the inflow and an arm raising test for the outflow, you can pretty much say where the problem is. 
after the physical examination, you really want to do what? Auscultation. We all forgot that, that we, do, we are supposed to carry a stethoscope. But if you do carry a stethoscope and if you uh, play, can you play the normal brewery, the first one, please? So that's a normal brew. If you, if you have a good fistula running through, blood is flowing through nicely, this is how you should be hearing. And if there is a stenosis, this is what you're going to hear. Can you play the second one, please? That's good. So it's important that we use the tools that we have effectively after knowing its limitations. Right? So if you are able to do a good examination and a good auscultatory and you know your access, you don't really need a surveillance. But let me ask, how many of us do actually can do all these things with, to every single patient in the limited time? I thought last time I knew it was only 24 hours in a day and we did have to do some sleeping. It's hard, especially for the volume of patients that we are seeing and we are going to see in the future. So it's extremely important that you also need some additional tools to compensate that kind of things. If we don't and if we continue to rely only on the monitoring, things like this might happen because some of the patients might fall through the crack. This level of ulcers and, and the fistulas, and sometimes, especially if you see this kind of a red granulation tissue on your fistula, you should be sending them to the OR. Or else you'll be sending them to somewhere else that you don't, really don't want your patients to go. So I hope I made my point clear as to monitoring is excellent, but we do have limitations in using monitoring alone. So we need a surveillance tool. Let's talk about how the ultrasound can fit into. Why is ultrasound so good and why am I so excited about it? Because now with all the uh, ac um, cost of the ultrasound coming down and the access being uh, access to the ultrasound in the rest of the world, I did not know that the situation in India was so bad till this morning when I saw that uh, act increased training, uh, their personnels are being more, uh, more and more trained, there are uh, standardized workflow and protocols, and it can also be used for post-intervention surveillance. The data using the ultrasound, though, so far, has been mixed. There have been some studies which have been positive, and some are negative, but they were all in avigrams and none in the fistulas. And if you notice this, they were all about close to decade and a half old. So what does that uh, tell us? That why is this compliance, uh, our compliances, or uh, why are we so not worried about surveillance, not developing something new? So that's where we really have to. But why is ultrasound so hard? Because of the single most factor, which is the trained personnel. If we don't even have access to the ultrasound machine, how are we going to, what's the point of training somebody, right? So every, nobody wants to learn a new skill if they, don't, if they can't use it. So it's very important the trained personnel is there to use, effectively use the ultrasound. Now, if you don't have a trained personnel, if you have a semi-trained or untrained, or if we make errors, we can have serious consequences like this. We are talking about the lifeline of a patient. So when we are going to use the ultrasound, it, it's extremely important that we learn the right way of using an ultrasound, doing an ultrasound, and it's always preferable that we do our own ultrasounds and not rely upon some other technologies. Believe me, I come from a land where everyone is, uh, all the ultrasounds are being done by the technologists, and all physicians have the same complaint. I can't believe what they, sh what they have studied because we just give a, get an image and, and we see the report, we go, uh, they go to the OR, they don't see the vein that the technologists saw. So it's very important that we do our own access, uh, ultrasounds. It's not really hard. There are a few, um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the physics part, there are only three uh, measures that we actually use if you want to uh, use, other than measuring the stenosis and uh, the whole nine yards. You, the spectral Doppler, the peak systolic velocity, and the volume flow. Volume flow is what you should be looking at, and, but for us to do the volume flow, you really need the peak systolic velocity. 
And the, when you do an ultrasound, you're doing pretty much the same thing. You're looking at the inflow artery, the anastomosis, that's the juxtanastomotic segment of the fistula, the body of the fistula, and anything which is the draining vein. Along with that, you are going to look for some additional uh, information like any co accessory veins, collections, aneurysms, and the whole nine yards. But as I've been telling, if you want to do the ultrasound, do it properly. There are a few things that you have to really pay attention to. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to, and it was already dealt in the morning, but the cursor line, okay. yeah, we can go for that. Cursor line, sample volume, angle uh, correction, and gain are the most important. So the cursor line is that white line that you see. Okay, that's your gate, that's the gap between the white line. That's the angle, okay, and that's your diameter four parameters, that's all you have to do, right? You can then, you can get, the, uh, get your waveforms and you can create a volume flow measurements. As Dr. Uh, such they were, Bharat was telling earlier, yesterday when they, uh, they just had the uh, peak systolic velocity and the end diastolic, you can just use this formula to calculate the volume flow. If, you're, if your device doesn't have that uh, whole information, you can use this formula. Only problem is, when you are going to use all those things, you have to know where was this axis or the, uh, the flow measurements done? Or what is the best site for flow measurement? Brachial artery. Why? It is relatively constant. Your fistulas can grow in time, but the, fistula, the, uh, the brachial artery diameter does not increase as much as the fistula, right? So it is relatively constant. It's deeply positioned, so one of the skills is about getting that angle under 60, uh, under nine, um, under 60 degrees. If the vessel is a little bit deep, it's much easier for you to move your probe and create a uh, less than 60 degree angle. And the brachial artery flow, 90% of it is destined to the fistula. So if the fistula flow goes down, brachial artery flow will also go down, right? So it's related, uh, it, it is uh, comparable, so you, it's important to use the brachial artery volume flow measurements. When you're checking the peak systolic velocity, you have to understand the flow needs to be laminar, okay? If you have a beautiful axis, and this is the artery and that's, the, uh, that's your fistula, the blood is nicely coming in a laminar format and it is going back, it's the best axis to do the ultrasound. But do we really need to know a, uh, do an ultrasound for a normal functioning fistula? No, we always go for what is not normal. Unfortunately, once you have a stenosis and others, the Laminar flow is now replaced by turbulent flow. These every single green line in a simulated manner is one uh, ve uh, velocity uh, line. So when you use your ultrasound and create the peak systolic velocity, it is very important where you're keeping the window. If the window has to be in the middle of the lumen because in the, in the turbulent flow, the middle of the lumen is the only place where you get a laminar flow. Okay, so the lim middle of the uh, of the artery or the uh, ve uh, vein, is that's where you should be measuring your peak systolic velocity. So once you get it, you create a uh, ratio, um, get the one in the stenosis and below the um, uh, one below, uh, proximal to the stenosis. And if you use the um, University of Alabama criteria, um, if the ratio is greater than two, that's quite sensitive for a 50% uh, clinically uh, significant stenosis on the angiogram which has been done. So we are gonna skip the velocity-based uh, flow. This is too crowded, I'm not gonna go into detail, but this is a, a, good, a good article which came out in 2012 which kind of uh, highlights your um, uh, various uh, ultrasound parameters for making the diagnosis and interpretation for, um, using the ultrasound. So, what do you do with, after doing an ultrasound study? And you're, if you're going to be following a certain parameter, I would, I would suggest that you follow that on a um, regular basis. And if the volume flow is less than 500 or, you know, uh, less than 500 are the ones which are at risk for thrombosis. If your flow drops by more than 25% between two studies and your studies are accurate, then those are the axes which are at high risk for thrombosis and which needs further intervention. With that, I want to conclude that ultrasound has a great role to play for the future. It is more than just a surveillance tool, it is more of a diagnostic surveillance tool. It's, uh, it's not just for uh, noticing the, if there is a stenosis, but it's also great for hemodynamic uh, observations. I know it is difficult to incorporate in dialysis workflow, but there can be innovative ways to incorporate this. 
uh, the most important thing that we really need to um, get over is this lack of training facilities for nephrologists, and I'm so glad that the Avtar gives uh, us an opportunity to overcome that uh, first hurdle. With that, I conclude and take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe.